Good evening. Welcome to this evening's um, school board workshop. Um, with us this evening, we have the um, uh, budget manager for the town, Scott Wyman, as well as um, our, our finance chair, Michael Moore, who will, after I say a brief words of introduction, will take over this evening's meeting. We also have a special guest with us via Zoom meeting. Uh, Meredith Nadeau has been out traveling. However, since we have rescheduled this meeting many times, uh, Meredith wanted to ensure that she was able to participate this evening. So you can give us a wave hello, Meredith, if you can hear us. Um, so um, just briefly, I wanted to overview the um, agenda for the evening and then turn the meeting over to our finance chairs. We introduced the 2015-2016 school board budget. We'll go over uh, the budget presentation. Meredith will help us do that. Um, after the superintendent's budget presentation, we will review the community services and pool overview discussions with Russell Packett from Community Service. Thank you for being here. Um, and we'll also review the capital improvement plan um, and then We'll also break into a workshop with just the school board members, and you're more than happy to participate um, and sing along with us as we review the 2015 school board goals. So with all of that said, I turn it over to our finance chair, Michael Moore. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Joe. Um, so just so everyone understands the, uh, the process, uh, tonight the superintendent will review uh, the 2015 2016 school budget, uh, all the materials are available for a stakeholder review on the uh, Cape Elizabeth School District website. If you go to the school board page, click on budget, it'll take you to the budget uh, web page where all these materials are available. Uh, given these materials were just posted uh, to the website, um, tonight the superintendent will present the budget but we will not review it. Uh, any parts of it tonight the reason is we want to give stakeholders time to review the budget uh, review the budget and ask questions so uh, the next steps would be after tonight's presentation we'll have workshops uh, on March 17th other dates in March uh, the items that will, will be presented at those workshops are also available on the school board uh, budget website um, so Meredith I'll turn the floor over to you to review or present the 2015-2016 school budget. Thank you, Michael. And I apologize if um, people do have questions that I, and I need to ask you to repeat them. It's just because the audio is a little bit in and out um, with so many of you kind of spread out in the room. But um, our budget process as a district starts way back in the fall. Um, building administrators work with staff in their buildings to field requests and determine what is necessary for the school district in order to meet student needs. And we're looking at all of our work through the lens of our strategic plan goals and objectives. Uh, as a reminder, those four goals include ensuring opportunities for the success of all students by providing a high quality and comprehensive instructional program. Goal two, expanding learning opportunities for all students by cultivating an inclusive and supportive district culture. Goal three, to increase student engagement in learning and teacher engagement in instruction. And goal four, to align the district budget with strategic plan goals and target resources accordingly. So as we go through the budget presentation tonight, you'll hear me speak to some of our um, requests in the, through the lens of those strategic plans, goals, and objectives. Our budget goals um, remain to support the vision mission values guided by the strategic plan. But our foremost objective always is to meet the needs of students. We also work to move the district forward and to be mindful of the impact to taxpayers. This year's budget um, represents a 2.6% increase over last year's budget, a total dollar increase of $600,000, $600,313 for a total budget of $23,840,487. And those numbers should say 1415 and 1516. I apologize. Some highlights of our 2014 15 school year we implemented full day kindergarten and gifted and talented programming. We expanded our world language program to first grade. We implemented an advisory program at the high school as well as full daily advisory in grades seven and eight at the middle school. We've made our universal screening system available at all levels in reading and mathematics, and we approved a one point 
$7.5 million school facilities bond. Actually, the town council approved it. What's different for this year? Again, as we look at goal one, to ensure opportunities for the success of all students by providing a high quality and comprehensive instructional program, we started um, by facing a 2.8% projected decline in enrollment. And the numbers for enrollment are in an enrollment tab in the back of your binder if you want to look more specifically. But essentially, we're dropping from a current enrollment of 1,647 students to a projected enrollment of 1,601 students for the next year. As a result of that, we're proposing the reduction of one teacher at CEMS and one teacher at Pond Cove based on enrollment. And the good news about that is that um, there are retirements in each of those buildings, that, so we won't need to reduce staff. Um, in order to do that. We can absorb those reductions through retirement. Our budget also proposes funding for the Open Doors Studio Summer Program at all levels. You'll recall that last year, um, you approved the use of um, uh, remaining funds in last year's budget to provide that program to students in elementary and middle school. We intend this year to expand, expand that program to the high school level as well as to expand it from a 12-day program, which we operated this past summer, to a 16-day um, summer program. And the feedback that we received um, from parents and students on that pro program, excuse me, was extremely positive. So we're enthusiastic about continuing it, and we are tracking um, the progress of those students who participated last year as well. The budget also proposes the implementation of a preschool program. And we'll, we'll spend some more time talking about that program as we move forward through the budget process, but essentially it would be housed at community services and it's designed to target um, students um, whose needs might not otherwise be served and would include um, our special education students with in a preschool age being serviced at community services. Again, based on enrollment declines and our um, child count in special education has reduced since um, last year's proposed budget by about 4%, where we're projecting 153 students in special education next year. Um, and again, as a result of that, we're proposing the reduction of one special education teacher position and one educational technician position based on student needs. Um, right now, both of those positions are vacant. So again, it will not mean the loss of um, any employees. Our FY16 Dean budget also includes um, the addition of a point two or a one day a week gifted and talented teacher. As you're aware, when we started the program this year, we um, have been using consultant services for that program. Um, essentially, we will have a one day a teacher available to us um, four to five days a month to be able to consult in classrooms and support teachers in developing um, instructional programs and utilizing instructional strategies that will best benefit those learners in their classrooms. Goal two, um, speak to expanding learning opportunities for all of our students by cultivating an inclusive and supportive district culture. And so you recall that um, last year we talked a bit about our work on school culture in our schools. We had received support from CEF um, to build our um, work with Stan Davis at Pond Cove, as well as our work with Steve Wessler at the Middle and High Schools around sort of creating safe um, environments for children and learning. Um, and allowing kids to sort of speak up about um, issues that, that were on their mind. And so that climate and culture work um, this year has culminated at the middle and high school with um, sort of train the trainer model training occurring, where we now have um, staff members at the middle and high school training students in Steve's stand up speak up curriculum. And there's a civil rights team in place at the middle school. So those um, pieces will continue into next year, but at no added cost. We have added some costs for um, robotics program. Our fifth and sixth grade robotics program has begun to travel and compete. And the cost of that um, has added a little bit to our budget for next year. Again, to expand learning opportunities for all students, we're looking carefully at how to create learning opportunities, as the board is aware, that are not necessarily occurring within the walls of the classroom. Um, our longtime volunteer coordinator, Gail Schmader, has been is retiring this year. We announced her retirement at a recent meeting. So we're proposing to expand that position 
from the part-time volunteer coordinator position that has been in place to a full-time um, volunteer and extended learning opportunity coordinator position. So we envision, envision that position will be helping coordinate internship experiences for students, for example, as well as maintaining um, the volunteer services role that it has had in the past. Also because um, staff is a great part of our, our work, we're proposing um, the addition of a human resources coordinator at the central office. That position will be shared with the town and in part that's a result of a town audit which looked at um, needs for streamlining some services at the town level around um, FMLA, paperwork, um, uh, workers comp issues and some other things that were decentralized for the town. Well those have been centralized within our side of the department in order to sort of meet everyone's needs because we share our business office resources, we're proposing the addition of that position. Um, and we think that will help us to pick up some of the work that the volunteer coordinator has been doing as well in terms of background checks, for example. Goal three of the strategic plan um, increases our district professional development lines to support gifted and talented and summer school programs. We also have included about $12,000 for the NEASC visit, New England Association of Schools and Colleges visit to the high school, as well as $30,000 for innovation support. And just to say a little bit about that, again, we start building our budgets back in the fall, in October, and to sort of work in a 21st century school requires the ability to be somewhat flexible and innovative and nimble and responsive to ideas and concerns as they arise. Um, the idea of those funds is that the innovation team We'll have the flexibility to review proposals that come forward from within the district to look at options for um, adjusting um, program or resources or, or needs in classrooms. So they could be used to purchase, for example, standing desks, if that were a need that a teacher perceived that hadn't been previously budgeted, or a field experience that a teacher wanted to try to incorporate in their classroom that supported instructional objectives. Um, I can envision a variety of activities, but the idea would be that the innovation team would sort of vet those proposals as they come forward and make decisions about the allocation of those funds. Again, because technology is a large part of the work that we're doing in, in a in district, as we are one-to-one -one at grades 7 through 12, and we'll be um, basically one-to-one -one in fifth and sixth grade next year, and we're about two to three to one um, at the elementary, will be about two or three um, students per device at the elementary school next year requires some additional software. So you'll see increases for software in all of the budget lines across schools. Our goal three again for technology envisions the replacement of two grade levels of iPads and purchase of cases for those to enhance their lifespan a little bit because the, the retiring devices from the high school will be recycled down um, into the elementary and middle schools. In addition, our technology lease um, which is a big one, um, envisions replacing the com teacher computers at Pond Cove. Again, staff there are working with devices that are somewhat out of date and um, slow makes, makes some of their work slow and cumbersome. Goal four, again, it's essentially about aligning the budget with strategic plan goals and targeting resources accordingly, but we have incorporated our capital improvements work within goal four. Next year will be the first year of that bond payment um, for the roofing projects at each school, the HVAC um, work and the electrical upgrades scheduled for the high school. Additional CIP projects include replacement of the phone system at the high school, waterproofing of some of the brick work at all three schools, duct work, exhaust fans, and a variety of other projects that are detailed in the facilities and transportation section of your budget. We've seen also an increase in our district contribution contribution to state retirement um, from not form 2.65 to 3.36 percent of each el eligible employee's gross wages. Essentially, for us, that's our teacher and administrator. Our, that those are our teachers and administrators. We also proposed upgrades to our district and town accounting and payroll software. As I mentioned in my narrative, we are currently using paper purchase orders, paper checks. Um, things that are uh, a little hard to imagine in the 21st century so um, we envision that replacing that software will help us to improve some efficiencies within our offices that can be allow us to, allowing us to reallocate some time to instructional work 
We also envision, again, one of the school board's priorities is communication, some money set aside to renew our district website. And we're working still with some unknowns. Um, the cost of insurance premiums increases will likely not be known until sometime in April. And while we've received preliminary general purpose aid numbers, which I'll touch on a little bit later, as you all know, the, the state legislature reserves the right to make changes to that right up until the very end. So we won't know that for, sh for sure what the impact of those changes will be. Um, I learned today that the State Education Committee did uphold the recommended funding around charter schools. We, you'll notice that we removed the $60,000 for charter schools um, from our budget that we had budgeted last year. The intent would be that the state will cover those costs um, at the state level prior to um, allocating general purpose aid. So um, at this point, we think we're on the right track with that, but again, that, that remains to be seen. Major changes for 2015, 2016. Again, these represent the details that are um, that we've sort of summarized. You'll see at Pond Cove an increase um, over last year of $12,567. That is essentially um, because of the preschool supplies and materials. The middle school, you see a total increase of $23,125. Most of that is represented in supplies, a small amount in books, and most of those supplies relate to um, science and mathematics supplies. We're needing to update some materials and um, resources in our science and mathematics classrooms. The high school, you see a total reduction of $26,762. And again, this is the non-staffing side of the budget. Um, PAS tuition, because our average number of students attending has increased. You see an increase for next year of $14,527. The reduction in charter school tuition that I mentioned previously of $60,000. And again, and the, the large piece there, again, is the addition um, for the NEASC accreditation visit of $12,988. And that essentially covers the visitors who come into our district, their lodging, their food, um, et cetera. At the superintendent's office, you see a $20,000 increase for professional services. Those are the money specifically um, discussed to upgrade the district website or renew the district website. And the $50,000 increase in software, again, to upgrade the district accounting software um, and, and help bring us into the 21st century um, in, that op in that office. Not that our employees aren't in the 21st century, but it would be nice to have software that goes along with that. In our facilities office, the facilities department, you see a net increase of $239,247. We begin with a really nice um, offset of decrease of $118,000 in heating oil and propane gas. Um, again, good to great oversight on behalf of our facilities director, Greg Marles. We've been able to lock in at a great price for next year, saving us, um, again, as you see there, substantial funds as we move into the next fiscal year in our um, heating oil. Our CIP and contracted services budget, and again, we'll, we'll discuss this in further detail when we review the facilities and capital improvements portion of the budget. Um, but that increase represents what we had anticipated through the bond bonding process in our 10-year facilities plan, an increase of $346,002. And again, some minor adjustments there, slight decrease in electrical um, service, for example. Transportation remains relatively flat, an increase of $3,500 essentially um, for salaries and benefits. In staff and student support, here you see um, the increase for gifted and talented. Again, this is not the teacher portion and summer school, but these are the supplies and materials and professional development required there. And the $30,000 for innovation. Um, Volunteer services, again, that's only the supplies, so there's not a significant increase there. No change in um, the instructional support, non-staffing side of the budget. Um, slight increase in athletics at the high school due largely to dues and fees, as well as um, slight increase to the capital set aside there that we began last year for replacement of equipment. And our major decrease in debt service, again, part of um, what was anticipated through the bonding process. So again, the total increase that you see there, um, major expenditure changes, $600,313. If you look by account, um, and again, this is how we report to the state, 
about some of the spending, but you see the largest in or a large increase there in salaries and benefits that represents a 3.9% change. Um, you know, we have projected an increase of 8% for health insurance. Whether or not that will be borne out remains to be seen, um, but but that's where where we have plugged in a figure at this point. Um, we also don't know at this juncture what increases will look like for support staff as we are bargaining, we're about to begin bargaining with those units. I think we've addressed the others. Um, again, a total increase of 2.6%. So if we look at our expenditures, we have the increase of $600,313, a 2.5% 2.58% increase over last year's school budget. What we're also seeing though, as you slide down to the revenues, again, this is preliminary information from the state, but we're looking at a $447,000 increase in our state revenues, um, an increase of about 17.5%. Um, we've been told by the state that some of that has been is due to our special education costs. Again, it's great news for us at this juncture, but whether or not that will last remains to be seen. In our three-year budget plan that we laid out last year, we projected um, undesignated funds being spent in the amount for this year of $250,000. So you see that reduction um, in line with what we had projected for last year. And a slight increase in our high school activity fees. So we've seen a slight uptick in um, funds coming in from students there uh, for our athletic participation, largely. So again, um, a, a total revenue increase of $600,313 to get to that 2.6%, but the impact on local, local property taxes, it's a $302,163,000 increase. So a 1.5% um, impact for taxpayers. And you see down below, that represents roughly a, um, and I'm not sure if this is right, Scott, if I'm looking at the right slide or not, so you may have to correct me here. Um, this one says in a medium home of $314,000, projected property taxes for education would increase by $79. My recollection is that they were increasing by about 12 cents per thousand. Is that correct? That's right, and that's now going to be $38.65 as we calculated it. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It'll be $38.65 is the new calculation okay. today. Um, so again, a 1.5% tax increase over last year's total town tax rate of $1,680 per thousand dollars of valuation. Again, you see the state subsidy change. It's shown as a negative here, but it is not a negative. It's a 17% increase over last year's funding from $2,533,000 to $2,980,000. Again, for a total expenditure increase of 2.6% and a net impact to taxpayers of 1.5%. And, a half percent. and um, Michael, I, I think you would agree that this schedule looks slightly different than the one um, that we had looked at previously. I wasn't sure how the board might want to handle the facilities and CIP portion of the budget that we were originally um, proposing to look at tonight, uh, but had to move because of the date change. So this draft anticipates moving those to the next meeting on March 3rd um, and looking at, at that meeting at technology and staff and student support as well and using the March 17th meeting to look at staffing and benefits as well as the budgets of all three schools, instructional support and athletics. And um, the wrap up meeting schedule hasn't changed but would look at contingency, revenue, our three year budget plan, any unfinished items and budget adoption on the 24th. So I leave that obviously to the board's discretion and whatever you decide we'll be happy to support. And that's it. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Meredith. Um, all the budget materials again are available on the school board website. Um, this happens every year where uh, the agenda and what topics will be addressed uh, may shift. But if you're looking for uh, the agenda for upcoming workshops, go to the budget uh, website page on the school district website. Um, we will uh, provide opportunities at every workshop for public comment. Um, if you're unable to attend a workshop meeting but have questions, uh, comments, supports, great ideas for moving the district forward, uh, please email the school board. Uh, we make a practice of every email we receive 
that the school board receives is you, you will get a response. Um, so if you have questions on the budget, please uh, reach out to us. Um, so to give the community and stakeholders time to review uh, these budget materials, uh, we won't review in detail any of the items tonight. Uh, the main reason is we want to give stakeholders time to look at the materials. They are posted on the website. And then reach out, us, reach out to the school board for us to answer questions. And we will update the uh, workshop, the budget workshop calendar. Uh, so please attend. If you're able to attend, again, we want your input and your thoughts. So please uh, email uh, the school board. Um, so I think uh, unless there's any questions from the school board on, yes, Barbara. <clears throat> Meredith, um, can you speak for a moment back to goal one when you were talking about the reduction of two special ed staff, one ed tech and one teacher. I don't think I heard you talk about the pretty significant recommendation of reducing the director to 0.5. Can you elaborate on that just for a moment? Sure. Um, you know, again, as we look at um, staffing as a district overall, we need to be thoughtful about how we're using our resources. We've seen a decline in special education um, enrollment over the last four years. I can't speak off the top of my head to before that, um, of about 27 students, um, about a, a sixth of our total student population from 180 to a proposed 153 for next year. Um, and as we look at resources, that's an area where, um, as we have full, a full complement of administrators at each of our schools, where I think we have some um, some capacity to make adjustments. So we have proposed reducing the director of instructional support position to half time um, in the next for the next fiscal year. Um, that would mean shifting of some of those responsibilities, for example, gifted and talented and English language learner responsibilities would shift to our director of instruction. Um, our building administrators already have a large part of the responsibility to be the LEAs for meetings. Uh, but it potentially would also mean the transfer of some of the responsibilities for staff evaluation to the building administrator level. Thank you. And if there aren't, uh, are there any more questions from the board? Obviously, we'll have uh, workshops that address every uh, topic and every line item. So the thought is to have a uh, give opportunity and time for stakeholders to review that so they can also, um, you know, ask questions and, and hear uh, responses as well. So is everyone okay if we move on to the community services budget? Just to set uh, the framework, um, we have a one-town concept, and um, that means uh, the school board over has oversight of community services. I get asked this question every year. Uh, Michael, is the community services budget in the school budget? And the answer is no. Uh, even though the school board has oversight of community services, they're separate budgets. So um, when the school budget goes to referendum, when you're voting on the school budget, you are only voting on the school budget. The community services budget is an entirely separate budget, um, just so uh, people understand that they're, they're two distinct budgets, but school, the school board has oversight of uh, community services. Hi, David. Um, so uh, again, we do want to have opportunities for public to provide input, comments, and questions. So we are going to review the community services budget tonight. However, we will not be approving it. We want to get stakeholder input, so Russell's going to walk us through the budget. We will ask more detailed questions uh, about the community services budget, uh, the funding model, opportunities, and investments. Uh, but we will, we will not be approving the, the community services budget tonight. At a future workshop, uh, Russell will be available to ask in a, uh, any questions or respond to any questions from the community. So Russell, if you'll Go through your budget, and then school board, you, uh, this is your time to ask questions um, about the budget. So. so, Michael, with the board's permission, I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, Russell, Russell and Scott will take you through the rest of the items there, but I will see you in a few days. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. One question, Michael. Um, 
we have oversight. We have to approve, but ultimately the town council is the one that approves it. Isn't that right? Uh, correct. So we will present a budget to uh, the town council uh, for the community services, uh, but ultimately they will approve um, the community services budget. Good evening. Um, so I'll go through the, what is being proposed for the community services budget. Um, and I sh assume you're all open to that tab. Um, there are four items that I want to talk about initially. Some have budget impact, some do not. Um, we're going to talk about the Cape Care Preschool Program. We're going to talk about pool staff uh, compensation. We're going to talk about facility upkeep and costs associated with that. And then finally, the funding formula. And then after we talk a little bit about it, we'll go into the actual budget and, and I can talk about the, fo the funding formula and the budget itself. Uh, the, what, the one thing I'd like to let you all know about the, uh, the Cape Care Preschool Program is that we are, we are finishing up a two-year uh, completion of a transition from a kinder care program to the preschool program. Uh, we're currently operating two rooms for third, three and four and five, three, four, four, five-year-olds. Uh, we have 25 children in those two rooms. In addition to those uh, children, we are servicing 88 children throughout the uh, district who are either before or after care children. Uh, we're open from 7.30 to 5.30. Uh, something new and exciting for us is that we're beginning the, uh, the national accreditation process uh, through the National Association of Education of Young Children, or NACI. Um, the, the hardest part about this process is it's going to be a year and a half long. Um, the first step was an application process that went into the USM Muskie School, which is kind of overseeing this program. Um, and it was it's an application just to be part of the cohort. Uh, and we found out just this week that we have, our, our application has been accepted. So we're, we've, we're actually starting this process. It could take up to, again, a year and a half. Our goal is to be cert accredited by the fall of 2016. Um, that, that has no implication budget-wise, that information. I just thought, because we've talked about it year over year, that it would be information that would be nice to share with you. What does have an impact a little bit on the, uh, on the budget is pool staff. Uh, about uh, last May or June, Andrew, who was the director of the fitness and pool facility down there, uh, came to me and said he was having, struggling a little bit with staff, keeping staff, and that he felt our compensation rates were not up to standards of our peers in the surrounding areas. So we, we conducted a survey, South Portland, Portland, uh, Westbrook, and Greeley were the four that we surveyed. And in the end, what we discovered is not only were our lower end staff not meeting up to standards of our peers, but neither was our, our head lifeguard staff. Um, and so what you'll, dis what you'll see in this is, a, is a basically a 10.9% increase in staffing costs for our full-time staff, which are Eric and Casey. Their, their hourly rates of pay were up, so anywhere from 2 to $3 an hour less than South Portland. Um, and uh, we just felt it was fair and to, to get them in line, close to, uh, they're not still in line, but they're closer um, in this budget. The next item is facility upkeep and costs. Um, over the last couple of years, the, the school board's building and grounds committee worked on the development of a CIP program. Uh, when I initially pre uh, presented and prepared and presented my budget in December, there were a number of items that were on that facility plan um, that I did not include. Um, and I didn't include them, or we didn't include them, it was Greg and I working together. Um, mainly because um, of the next item, which was the funding formula. Um, so uh, Meredith asked to go back and put those items back in, uh, into the budget, and, and let it go through the process. Um, and so you will see some significant increases in CIP um, in both the community center side of the budget and the pool side of the budget. The next item was the funding formula. Now, this was a, this was a concept that Michael brought forth uh, uh, last January, I believe, when my advisory committee met with the school board. And, and the concept was, uh, is there a way that we can come up with a formula that year over year, we can at least come up with a sense of what should be the local share appropriation for community services? 
When I presented the budget last year, I presented a, a funding formula that worked with last year's budget, although at the time I said it works this year. I'm not sure what might be facing us down the road that may skew this to the point where it doesn't work. Little did I know that it would be one year later um, that we would be looking at this again and adjusting. And so after, our, after I presented my budget to Meredith and Scott, the next night the school board met with my advisory committee again, uh, and this topic came up. And out of that was uh, maybe we needed to go back, or I needed to go back, and look at the funding formula now that we had these concept of maybe some big ticket items for, for CIP projects. And honestly, it was two nights later, probably like three in the morning, um, when I woke up and I couldn't sleep and I was thinking about this and I thought, oh, I think I've got the idea. And, and I should have gotten out of bed and written it all down, but I thought I could trust myself. Um, so the next morning I came to work and I sent Meredith and Scott an email and I said, I've got a concept, let me kind of blow it by you and, and let's talk. <clears throat> Basically what I did was I wanted to kind of take community services and divide it into two elements. One is community services, the department, which provides programs. One is community services facilities, or the facilities that we're kind of overseeing or being partners in, and that's the pool and the community center. And I wanted to be able to kind of develop the formula that said, if the stakeholders, if the leadership in the community believe it's prudent to be putting money into either one of those facilities, that it becomes incumbent on the taxpayers to provide that in order to make it happen. If not, if it's part of a funding formula, it now becomes incumbent on the users of our programs to, to, to make up that money. And in some cases, it would be a significant increase in user fees. And um, I felt that the backlash of that would not be in anybody's best interest. So I came up with this formula, and basically I put it in, in, uh, into two areas, and we got to talk about the numbers, you can see how I broke it out. Basically what becomes the following, debt on the community ser uh, services side, debt service and power plant community center are 100% ta taxpayer supported. Commun Russell, yes. Uh, it might be helpful um, using the term power plant. It will, uh, what is, um, reading through this, and I didn't mean to interrupt, but maybe I use, it's used as you have power plant used in both the pool and community services, but what is, if you could define? Well, I tried to just take out items that um, you would have to, if the building was there and nobody was in it, uh, we weren't, community services wasn't in it, you know, it, you would have to, you'd have to spend that money to keep the building open, the pool. If all you did was have um, the building open and anybody can come and swim anytime they wanted to, what were the costs that were associated with that? And I tried to kind of narrow it down as best I could. Power plant would mean, you know, buildings. Yes, uh, custodial services, that kind of stuff. Um, that's how I kind of looked at it, yes. All right, so I, I did that for 100%. Then I took, I look at community services administration, and I took all of the administration. In previous years, I had broken it down into different areas. I took all the administration, and I said that, six, that of that cost, 6.5% would be tax supported, and 93.5% would be user fee supported. Below that, our, program our, our individual programming departments, adult programs would be 10%, uh, excuse me, 10,000 tax supported for the senior discount, the balance user fees. The Cape Care program and youth programs, 100% user fee supported. On the pool side, I looked at, again, power plant debt services, 100, we don't have any um, debt service at the moment at the pool, but we probably will down the road. 100% tax supported. Pool administration, 18.5% tax supported, with 81.5% user fee supported, and the pool program, 100% user fee supported, pool programs. Now, when I started this before, now we'll go into numbers. When I, when I took the original, uh, project, uh, original proposal I gave to Scott and Meredith, I used last year's formula. When I converted to this formula, I used the same bottom line number. In other words, I started with, this is what the formula would have been with basically none of the CIP stuff, and this is how I could stand in front of you and say, this is the formula I gave you, and it had a tax-supported number. I have the same tax-supported number here. I started with the same tax before I did the CIP piece. So I was trying to get apples to apples as close as I could get. 
So now if you go to page four, we can talk about the actual community service budget. You can see the very first thing on the top is the debt service. It remains the same. It's 100% tax supported. Next is what I call the power plant items. Um, and it is, again, 100% tax supported. There is a, a $7,400 increase in capital improvement projects on the, on the community service side. The next uh, grouping below is community services admin, as I said earlier, 6.5% tax supported. There's actually a decrease in this particular area, mainly due to our decrease in oil. Um, decrease in what? Oil costs. In the, on page five, our adult programs, again, that's, th these are historical numbers when I use. If there's an increase, uh, if, for example, the very first line, it's an increase only because my actual from last year was, was higher than I, I, you know, I had budgeted before. I, I thought it'd be more realistic. It's a number that's 100% covered by user fees. Um, youth programs, again, 100% uh, covered by user fees. So that any kind of an increase in these areas are not tax supported at all. They're, they're basically user fee supported. See discount. Russell, just to clarify. Yes. Um, under programs, adult programs, it says ten thousand tax supported. That is. Just, so, so it's it's really one hundred percent user fee, except for a ten thousand dollar for the uh, senior support discount. for the senior discount. Yes. Thank the, you. the balance is all user fee. You're quicker than I was, Michael. <laughs> Uh, again, on page six, the Cape Care program, 100% user fee supported. The fitness center, and then I'll, I'll, I'll explain it again here, the fitness center, it is 100% user fee supported except for the $10,000, which is local tax supported, which was approved a couple of years ago for the equipment reserve or capital outlay line. Page seven is the pool. The pool, again, the power plant items, the, the big increase there is the CIP. It's 44,000 of the 49,000 increase. 100% uh, tax supported. The pool admin section, which was the 18.5%, again, uh, 81 and 81.5% user fee supported is our admin, which is where our full-time staff is. The increase there of the 10.9% for the staff. Pool programs, which is everything else we run in, far, in regards to programming, is next. Yes, Joe. Quick question. On the $43,000 increase for the CIP, are there particular things that you could yes. enlighten us? Yes. <laughs> Um, the items that, that Greg has for, for uh, the pool side, um, uh, there is $32,000 in there for our, basically our pool heater repairs. Um, you've probably heard about the pool heater has gone beyond its life expectancy. We're trying to limp it along until there could be a bond item down the road. Um, there's going to be some work that is needed there. The spa, which has been the bane of our existence this winter. Um, it it needs the hot tub. Uh -huh. hot tub. No, yeah. I was going to say it's not a spa. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's called a spa. Um, the hot tub uh, has a, a new heater in, in this CIP. And for how much? Uh, 35000 um, There's pool tiling for $5,000. There's a pool pump replacement for 4200 There's shower valve updates for $7,500. Um, and there's interior pool door replacements for $4,800. That total it comes up to $88,500. Um, and the line that's $108,000, which is building, it includes $20,000 in maintenance. So the CIP is, is $88,000 of that $108,000. So, so Russell, uh, there was this two separate heater items, one of repair for the... One for the pool heater, one for the, one for the hot tub. Complete replacement of the hot yes, tub. Yes, hot tub. It's a gas heater installation. Okay. That is, that is singular to the hot tub. But the pool heater is just a repair. Just a repair. And we're limping along toward what in the CIP plan, according to my recollection, is a, if, if, it, if it's bond 
anticipated to be bond fund funded, then it's a 2020 or 2021, yes. That's and we, are we, are we going to limp along that long? Uh, that's our hope. That's our hope, okay. And, and did you say that the new hot tub heater was or would be $35,000? Uh, yeah, gas, yeah, gas heater, $35,000. And, um, and do you know what, the, I'm just curious, the rough ballpark cost of a brand new heating system for the pool would be? Are you sitting down? Um, last time I heard, it was upwards of four hundred thousand dollars. We need a room. Which so maybe uh, this is very helpful. It, it might be helpful to to, um, to make that schedule available um, to the board and put it on the website because I'm the CIP. Oh yeah, I mean these. these right. Yeah, just because I'm sure we'll get a lot of questions on um, you know. Uh, the, the large increase in, in CIP, so that yep. would help. And again, uh, I mean, I can answer some of this. Um, this really is managed by Greg in facilities, so I know the items that are happening. Um, I, I, you know, beyond this year, I couldn't tell you what's in the plan for a year down the road beyond that. Just one thing I noticed, um, you know, we have heat under your, your power plant category, but power plant would be basically you know, infrastructure, fixed cost, um, you know, non, non labor fixed cost. So, you know, the building itself, maintaining uh, the pool or community services, as well as um, heating and, and electricity. So, just one thing I noticed is you have heat included in your power plant category for the pool, but not community services. Exactly. I didn't know yeah, um, one, one of that, one of the, my reason behind that was the following. Um, the, heat, the, the primary heat in the pool is not necessarily the heat to heat the building. It's the heat to heat the pool, the water. Where in the, in the community center, which where our office is, where we have programs running all day long, um, part of that burden is I threw in with the admin of community services because that's our space. Where, again, if you just head the pool and you're going to maintain it at 82 degrees, um, that's where your money's going as far as power and heat is that is that hole in the in the ground and um uh, heat the heat uh line item for the pool is actually increasing and i'm sure i'll get you know a uh, stakeholder may say well didn't oil prices go down why is it going down everywhere else in the budget what's, what's uh, primarily the heating for this is not oil it's gas co um and those prices have been going up propane Mm -hmm. um, our, our CO costs have gone up 8% uh, last year, 10% this year. So the answer is it's a different fuel source. Different fuel source, yes. To some extent. Well, that may be the answer. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Could you explain? Um, sorry, yes. um, some people might be surprised at $35,000 for a hot tub heater. Can you explain what the purpose of the hot tub is in relation to the pool and the services it provides? Um, well, David, that's different for every individual, but there are a lot of individuals who access that hot tub um, coming out of the pool, going into the pool. That's where they end their workout. Um, it's interesting how many, when it, we, we were offline for several weeks this winter, uh, we had a lot, a lot of um, Complaints about that because the hot tub was offline. It's part of it's part of someone's overall workout that they end up in the hot tub. And and actually, they come out. The, the, the pool itself is around 82 degrees, and to me that seems like it's pretty warm. But it but it, to a lot of people it's not. They come out actually cold, and they use the hot tub in order to get um, to warm themselves up. So I, I I think that's a good point. I think it should be made. It's not like a hot tub where you in your house where you sit around and have recreation, I guess I'll say. Uh, my understanding is a lot of it's used by elderly, yep. older people, young kids. Yep. It, it enables them to enjoy the pool and to use the pool more efficiently. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so if I could, I would change the subject to the preschool program. Yep. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your work on it. I'm, uh, I, we're as as school board members, we're very excited about um, about the program, and uh, we appreciate the effort that's gone into it. I, 
my question has to do with squaring. Um, I'm not sure when you refer to Cape Care, whether that refers to the preschool program or just the? Um, that's probably the overriding uh, umbrella. OK, so uh, in here you say Cape Care and youth program are 100% user fee supported. Yes. So, but in Meredith's narrative, and I know she's not here, she refers to um, fifty thousand dollars in preschool funding. Can you help me understand what's happening? Um, she and I have had some early talks about what this meant. Um, way back in the beginning, the, the concept for for her and I was that there were going to be individuals who could, would not be able to access without some sort of help. Um, and, the, and I have costs that I need to, to meet. So it is, it, if we're taking, we're bringing in kids who need to have services and need to have access to that, and, there's, and it potentially um, limits my ability to generate the revenue to cover my costs, how do I, what, how do I balance all that? Um, and so how that money, what her thoughts are on that money, I can't answer for you, John, because we haven't, you know, I got this email on, on Friday that said that she was going to include it back in here. Um, and so we haven't had a chance so, to So that, that, presumably those funds then are not in your budget. They are not in my budget. Okay. Um, th so my follow-up question, and I, I don't know whether you can answer the question or not, but um, will the preschool program be available to all uh, CAPE students, eligible age appropriate CAPE students, regardless of ability to pay? Is that, is that what we envision for? Um, I don't think I can answer that 100%, John. Okay. And so I'd rather not. I mean, I, I don't. All right. That's that, that, would be an, that would be probably the concept. I'm not sure how to make it happen, that's all. Okay. With the space we have and, and everything. I think there's a demographics that, that, that they're, it, it, they're trying to meet. So I th what you're telling me, I think, is I need to ask the superintendent. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Just to yeah. follow up, isn't what Meredith's 50000 is to do something different as opposed to what it is to provide some sort of preschool for kids with special, uh, with disabilities? There, there's, a, there's a demographics that, that, the demographic I think they're trying to meet the needs for. We weren't meeting those needs before. They're so not that's meeting them. That's why I think 50,000 is instructional support from schools. Which Some of it is, yes. Uh, I, 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 I don't want to conjecture. Yeah, I, I think we'll ask the question of there's uh, preschool funds in two budgets. Why? What are they allocated to? So I'll submit that. I'm keeping a list of questions as follow up. So I'll. I may be able to help a little. Um, that fifty thousand dollars is um, split thirty-five thousand dollars for salaries and fifteen thousand um, dollars for supplies. Um, there's a lot of work yet still to do on the. There's a lot yet of, of work yet to, still to do, and, and this was a, a decision we didn't think we could come forward with until we found out that we had an increase in subsidy from uh, our general purpose aid schools. Uh, when we got that last week. Um, so it is still in the building, but the pre-K program is a formal program. We know that early interventions are, will help students become very successful and help the special education impacts if we can do early intervention. And those services are being cut down, but it would be a true, as far as I know, a true um, pre-K four-year-old program. And so part of that money is um, budgeted in Pond Cove under 15, uh, for 35000 for salaries, $15,000 for supply, program supplies. Just so you know, Russell does that when he's trying to. Uh... Yeah. So, so I guess well, the short answer is it's to help support our strategic plan goal of reducing the achievement gap. Yes. Of what? Sorry. So I, I would say I don't think we have an answer, so I'll keep yeah. that as an open item we can get clarification on. You go ahead and then I'll have a question after. Go ahead, Barbara. Okay. Um, and, and Scott, maybe you can help me with this, or Kelly, you must be involved in this whole conversation too in terms of transition. No. No. Okay. Um, CDS has been historically providing those services and sometimes will provide those on site right. without cost to the district. 
So can you explain why we're looking to take over costs that have been provided to us in the I past? Think part of the, um, the thinking is that it will be a formal program we are, where you have certified teachers teaching that program, as well as the CDS services are being cut back substantially by the state budget, so we have less students that even qualify to be in the program and less students that are being served. So they are cutting back CDS, CDS is being local back. services. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Kate? Um, that's great. About I call it NIAC. You call, some people call it in the, in the EC, I call it NIAC. Um, so that's great, the certification. Good luck with that. What's the overall um, amount of children that uh, in, the preschool, in the preschool you can have? Right now you have 25. We have 25. Capacity. Probably somewhere between, I would say, 30 and 35. And with the NIAC certification, it's a... Um, that's what people look for in yep. preschool, yep. Uh, and which is fabulous that you're already looking at that. We're really excited about that. Yeah. And is that 25 for four-year-olds or combined? combined between the two rooms? And then, um, if once hopefully you uh, receive certification, will that entitle you at all to any funds? Um, um, or otherwise, uh, that will not entitle us to any funds. Okay. What would entitle us to Potential funds down the road would be certification through the state DOE, which, which is which at the moment they're working on it and there has not been a formal not application yet. Yeah. But you can't become a um, universal preschool unless you have the NIAC certification. So it's the first step. Yeah. is what the state is saying now. Yeah. So that's great. Uh, that's great. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Um, yes. One more question about that. Um, I'm just reading in your narrative. Um, and how you want to work with um, or combining Cape Care with Pond Cove to make that transition. Have, is that already? There are already some things that are happening um, between the two locations. We're doing some professional development between the two. There's conversations between uh, kindergarten teachers and our preschool teachers. Um, so that's a transition that's already been happened. There's always been a good relationship between us and, and Kelly and the people at Pond Cove, so. Yeah, okay. Can I just add a? Yes, Barbara. Just, just, I don't know why Kelly's shaking her head, but I'm hoping that connection becomes tighter with the elementary administration if we're looking at a real transition program here. I'd like. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't yeah. see why that wouldn't happen. Yeah, thank you. Um, Russell, I was wondering about the playground. So I've seen that there's, with the preschool comes a need for a playground and currently and I saw I was thinking I would see it in the CIP model so can you just help me out with that um yes or maybe tonight tonight isn't the night to have that conversation well I mean we can I think what our goal is is to is there's a there's a first step which is a um a, a, a development and planning process um, that we have to kind of raise money to, to kind of get off the ground. Um, it is not in the CIP. I think there are probably some other items that are, that are more important from, from a you know, structural perspective. Um, and then um, we continue to plug along on, on the hope for a, for a playground, and, and that's going to probably be a, a large undertaking from a fundraising perspective. Russell, one, um, well, thank you. On the funding formula, this is something, uh, you know, throughout CAPE's history, that the community services was separate from the pool, but there's, if you ask someone, well, how, what is the funding model, there, historically, there really wasn't one. So I applaud you for being a risk taker and willing to, to stick your, your nose down and at least come up with some sort of strategy. But uh, for a stakeholder that says, I don't, I don't use the pool often, um, you know, that seems like a lot of increased expenditures how much of the incremental cost are, are being borne by pool users? So in other words, uh, you know, pool services revenue or pool programs are going up 4.2%. Um, you know, so either in this budget or longer term, you know, maybe discuss your ability to raise pool fees, but at the same time keep them uh, you know, competitive. Um. I think the hardest thing to do when you're talking about a facility is that there are, there are significant costs 
that go with keep, uh, the upkeep of, of a facility. And um, either, the, either the, the citizenry of Cape Elizabeth believes that the, that the Richards Pool is a community asset or they don't. Um, and, and that it could be a community asset whether or not you use it or not. Um, people move to this community because of, of what, we, what this community offers. And, um, and so it's a value to their, to their value in their, in their home that, that the community offers something like that. So whether or not they use the pool um, doesn't always relate to whether or not it's, it's truly a community asset. It's no different than I have no kids anymore, um, but the schools are important to the value of this community. Um, so when, when we talk about facilities, I think you look at it and say, um, it's really difficult to think about big ticket items and how to pay for them if you're putting their onus on the, the users because suddenly a pool membership goes from $320 a year to well $900 a year because suddenly we got to pay for $44,000 for a bunch of capital improvement items. Uh, it's, it, it's really not feasible to do it that way. So again, the, 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 my concept behind the formula really is that it allows the leadership of the community to make that decision. Either, either you want to, to keep up your community assets or you don't, um, they will deteriorate as years go on, so it'll, it'll become an item eventually. Either it's going to happen or, it's gonna, or you're going to have to sell them off, close them down, whatever you're going to do. Um, so that's my concept behind that. Uh, in this proposal, are the pool and fees increasing zero percent? There will be no. There'll be fee, there'll be fee increases in this in this budget in order to make that revenue number. Right for, for the pool. For yes. Pool okay. Across the board, probably. Just because I think, you know, some people may say it is a community asset, um, but if costs are going up, if the users, you know, maybe over time, um, you know, share in a little bit of of the increased in maintenance. So I think your formula tries to balance those uh, two tensions, so thank you. Yeah, I, I try, I mean, I think it does. I think there are items that go up year over year over year that it, it, you're talking about stuff, your administration, your, your staffing and all that stuff. If, you're, if you look at potentially, um, if your staffing numbers go, um, if your lifeguard numbers, for example, go up every year, the only place I make up lifeguard increases is that bottom line where it says 100% user fee supported. I don't have many place else. That's where they are. So in order to make that happen, the, the fees to go, whether it be swim lessons, whether it be pool rentals, whether it be memberships, all have to go up a little bit because I've got to cover that increase that's happening in that particular area. Pool admin, where 81.5% where of it is user fees. Anything that goes up there has to be... That 15, if you look at page seven, that $15,921 of increase, the taxpayer piece of that is about $3,000, somewhere in that range. The other $12,000 have to be made up in user fees. So while, while I'm saying up top there, Mike, that you, know, you, want to, you need to put a heater in there, the, the, the taxpayer leadership has to make, make the decision that that's what they want to do and, and cover it. It doesn't mean that community services isn't having to increase fees to make up every place else along this budget. Yes. Um, sort of to that, your earlier point about you know, the question of do you believe it's an asset pool or it's not an asset, I just noticed in, your, um, in your, one of your items the contingency uh, fund, because there's been some savings there, it's, so that's a reduction. I'm just curious whether or not you wouldn't just want to keep it steady year after year, like we have to think about. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, we have which would enable you maybe, in, in this case, of maybe some wiggle room to promote that, the concept of it really truly being an asset. Yeah, um, I, I think that, that is a line that we've seldom used. It's there just in case. Um, and it's just, and so, uh, and again, I, when I start out with this budget, I try to look at this and say, how can I make this as, as close to zero as I can? And, uh, and year over year over year, we're not using that line. I said, okay, let's keep something there, but can we, can we you know, cut it down a little bit? That was a conscious decision of my own, just to kind of help me along this process. Uh, well, I just I for one support the concept of the, the pool as a as a community asset. It's like the fort 
um, it, it, it's not inexpensive to maintain, but it, but, uh, it does make our community a, a better place to live. Um, another one of those community assets that was strongly supported by the community a couple of years ago uh, is the fitness center. And I wanted to ask about that fitness center equipment line. Yep. Um, and whether that's, it looks based on the, the actuals from last year that that's been a pretty appropriate number. Does that look like on an ongoing basis that, that, that that's the number that's going to be required to cover regular upkeep keep of the equipment in that room? At least in the short term, John, yes. I, um, we, were, we were able to a year ago replace um, three pieces of equipment and we replaced another three pieces of equipment this year. Um, I can tell you to date, that line is at $10,040 it's spent. I had a couple of pieces of equipment that kind of broke down in the middle of the year that we had to repair it was kind of hefty. But again, we've used pretty much that line, but I don't anticipate um, having to use any more than that. Um, you know, when we get it to July 1, if that $10,000 remains there, we'll order three more pieces of equipment. We may get to the point where it's five or six years from now where we say, we don't need that money at the moment, but I don't anticipate that. But um, it's a it's a revolving kind of equipment. We're not buying brand new equipment. We buy we're buying used to begin with, so there is a there is a shorter life expectancy on it. Could I add a couple points to that? Mm -hmm. um, there are certain things that you you have to repair and maintain. There are other things that cost almost nothing to repair and maintain, which is why that figure may be there for a while and then decrease because there are certain things that are treadmills and, and exercise bikes break down, weights and uh, probably three quarters of the equipment in there or half the equipment it doesn't break down. So that's big. And, th and I also think the upgrade in the equipment, you notice there was an increase in revenue in this year. I think that I can't say it was a direct correlation, but I think it having been there that there is better equipment, you get more people signing up. So it's, it's a hard one. But I don't think it's going to be 10,000 every year for seven years. It's going to decrease and probably something roll forward. We might have done. Suzanne? Uh, my, my question is also re replacing versus um, switching to something different that's perhaps more, you know, a newer piece of exercise equipment, not necessarily brand new, but like something that's, new, you know, has been at the local gyms. Not new, not but new. Not brand new, but but a new piece of equipment. We actually did pit. that. We actually did that two years ago. And how do you how do you how do you maintain relevancy? I suppose. Um, well, um, generally, it's the individual who uh, who does all of our servicing, um, who we have also had a really good relationship. Um, he has we bought the equipment off him in the last two years, um, and we sit them and say, "What do you have? What what should we have in here that we don't have?" Um, so it's a process that we go through. He kind of gives the, you know, his opinion as the, 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 the two or three pieces that we really should be looking at replacing. Who's that person? Um, you know, I don't use his name, but what's his role? Uh, he, he, we, we have a gentleman that comes in every month servicing all of our fitness stuff. Okay. It's a contract that we have. Um, hmm? Um, no, I, I'm just not curious. Steve. <laughs> Close though. Just, I'm just wondering what his expertise is. Yeah, no, this is his business. He comes in service. He's a, uh, General Fitness is the company out of Portland. That's his, can, he's all over the place in, in servicing in clubs and that kind of stuff. Well, so I think it might help um, yep. your, your uh, page four where it has a community services budget summary. Yep. And um, just to help people frame it, um, I know you always say, you know, the revenue and expenses aren't the same as uh, school budget revenue and expenses because some you know, have user fees, you know, um, so is, is one way to look at it, the local appropriation increase is 68,790 of that, reading your narrative, 51,000 is for CIP, so, and then, you know, 58,000 is CIP and fixed costs, so in other words, almost 90% of the increment is for, for fixed costs, such as CIP. Yeah, um, yeah. In, in the, if you look at the very bottom, uh, the local appropriation community services, the eight thousand eight six hundred and sixty four dollars. I believe the number seventy four hundred of that is the CIP. And if you look at the number which is the pool, which is sixty thousand over forty four thousand is the CIP. The one the one thing I would say about um, the concept of how I did this was that 
if the leadership in the, in the community believes that, um, that it's, for whatever reason, they don't want to, to, to spend the money in the CIP, for every dollar they take away, it's a dollar they save. Simple as that. If they say, well, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're only going to do $24,000 additional to CIP, then that number comes down to $20,000. It's a pretty much clear. If you say to me, um, well, we're going to eliminate, I don't know, a, a, a lifeguard. We're going to use a lifeguard example because it was 18.5%. For every dollar that I eliminate from that position, it's really only saving the taxpayer 18.5% or 18.5 cents because the balance of that salary is made up in user fees. That makes sense? I, I think Michael's point was that a, a very large portion of the increase is to maintain a Absolutely. fixed asset of the town. That's true. So it's sort of how we justify our capital uh, plan for all of our buildings yep. in this town. And mm -hmm. a much smaller portion was of, a, of the increase is for non-capital items, and a large portion of those non those items are covered by increases in user fees or expansion of them. That's true. Okay. My guess if you increased pool fees $44,000 this year, your membership may decline significantly. <laughs> we wouldn't raise it, Michael. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. So, uh, you know, CIP budget, uh, the details uh, is a follow up question. The preschool strategy in terms of uh, Cost allocation that's in the school budget versus community services is a follow-up item. Um, if any school board members have any other questions or they wake up in the middle of the night and have uh, questions, email me uh, those questions. Um, we're not voting on this tonight. Obviously, we need more information, but we will have on a future budget workshop agenda. Um, community services, a final review and adoption, as well as an opportunity for stakeholders to share their thoughts on this so is everyone oh, go ahead Joe no I just if you were as a wrap-up I was going to commend Russell on his work on this budget having sat on the Community Services Advisory Commission I know that you have struggled a long time trying to make it clear um, where the cost centers are and where the funding comes from for each of those cost centers and having both the users of the pool system as well as the taxpayers understand what their liability is for each of those portions. Mm -hmm. um, is, is really key to, um, I think, gaining support for your budget. So thank you for all that hard work and the really clever way that you came up with. Thank you. I, we'll see. Yeah. Thank you, Russell. All right. Thank you. Thanks. At this point, um, before I hand the uh, reins back to uh, uh, the school board chair to review school board goals, once again, um, all the information is available on the school board website on the budget tab. Uh, we know there's a lot of information, but um, it's all there for everyone to see. If you have questions, please contact us. There will be changes to the agenda in terms of what topics are addressed, so please look at the calendar on the website page and any changes to upcoming meetings, we'll, we'll make those on uh, the budget website page. Can I, uh, can I just ask a question about the, or maybe Scott, can you just explain to us what the, the updated yes. paperwork we got? You have, um, Thank you. Three, three pages. And then the narrative, um, my apologies, we've been making a lot of last minute uh, fixes. Um, so the first one is page 17, and that goes under the salaries and um, benefits tab. That's the very last the page. School board summary? Oh, that just is oh, the first page. I'm sorry, the, the first page uh, is your revenue. Page one. There's one and then it's 17. First is your revenue summary, um, expenditure budget, and that goes in uh, after Meredith's. Uh, narrative and then the are there changes in the, in the, in the it's in the um, numbers here or it's just in the, in the calculation at the bottom of the page there's, uh, page 17 is the bottom calculation and the, uh, change column and the percentage of change and what about uh, the summary um, uh, the only one on page one is the footnotes um, where we were able to change look at the tax rate um, because we included the um, 
school uh, mill rate as well. I met the town manager this morning. And just so everyone knows, that one we are going to uh, reconfirm with the town manager. Uh, whenever you deal with tax rates, there would be the overall town tax rate versus the school only for education purposes only portion. So um, we'll re review that um, and get back to you if there's a. Update. Thank you. And then the general operating budget, page one. And then um, the next one down is the staff and student support, and that's just a corrective total on the bottom. Change, percentage of change. So where does this new page go? That goes under staff and student support. Do you go in your, in your binder to staff and student support? Uh, um, second set of but tabs. It, it would be the, uh, the first schedule. So there's two schedules in there. It would be the one that currently says 5,229. This is the replacement. I'm just wondering, do we need to have this on air? <laughs> no. <laughs> This is the, the messiness of budget, so I think it's... I don't think the... We won't be um, accused of not being transparent. So. But the sausage <laughs> making needs to really be recorded and televised. Yep. And, then, and the last one really is just the facilities narrative. It's an updated one. And that goes into facilities and maintenance. The old one can come out, so no material changes in this first round of the budget book. Just some clarity. Um, and then I would just like to apologize to Kelly for not telling her that I put the preschool money in Bowen Cove's budget this weekend. So um, we had to have a placeholder of where to put that until that program is developed. And so it's easily identified as we talk about the budget and the future of the pre-K program. I'm sorry. Clearly not an easy task putting these binders together. So if there are any more questions from the board on the budget, I will uh, pass the gavel over to uh, the school board chair. Thank you, Mr. Finance Chair. Um, well done on the presentation of the budget, both for Meredith, who has um, signed off, as well as to your clear directions on understanding the budget and to Russell's presentation. Um, really looking forward to digging in further. So the next item on this evening's agenda is the um, 2015 school board goals. Um, these are developed at our retreat every year um, during January. We take a, a morning out to discuss sort of where we are as a district and where the school board would like to focus its energies for the upcoming year. So traditionally, um, over the years, these school board goals have been especially vital in years that when we didn't have a comprehensive strategic plan. Um, and I'm sensing that um, the role of these goals for the school board may be evolving as we um, now have a comprehensive strategic plan so that some of the goals in our discussion that we ended up putting into this first draft are actually um, mirroring and repeating what was in the strategic plan. And what I'm suggesting um, as we review our goals is to really sort of focus on not necessarily reiterating what has been um, a well thought out strategic plan. We don't need to replace or supplant that, but how we can supplement what's already being done in our district and what we as a board can do to help support the efforts behind that strategic plan through our goal making process. Um, and I just before we review the goals, I just sort of wanted to get a consensus from you all on the purpose of these goals so that it would help focus our discussion. Does that make sense? Um, yes. And I, I think, quite frankly, the strategic plan has 
gone a long ways towards alleviating the need for these goals. Um, but my, my thought, quite frankly, would be looking at a couple of drafts that circulated, and people have done, I understand because I was there, that people made their best effort. Uh, we ran out of time during our retreat. People made their best. Come on. I guess I can. <laughs> um, that uh, um, we didn't have time to fully articulate it, so these were attempts to um, what our ideas were then. I guess my main thought was um, what we have as drafts, uh, they're not goals. There are uh, sort of goals, sort of methods, sort of different ideas about how to maybe get there. Whereas last year, um, I pulled it, and um, I, I like that concept where there's single sentences where there's actually a goal, where we figure out how we get there or what do we have to do. And a lot of those goals still exist. Um, so I guess my thought would be to, um, I actually recrafted last year, it's just today, um, is to make it similar to, simplify it and make it very similar to what we did last year, and that is have, it, have a item as a goal um, and without a lot of discussion about and backup as to how we get there and, and um, so forth, because we don't know yet. We, we, these are goals that we want to do, and that's what it should be. And I, I, for whatever it's worth, I marked up last year's one and could circulate it at some point. It makes no sense to do it now, but that would be my theory on the strategy involved. Well, I think your opening sentence about wondering whether there's still a need to have um, school board goals when we do now have a comprehensive strategic plan is a conversation worth having. Um, it, and I thank you for bringing that up because that was something that had crossed my mind as well. How do the rest of you feel about that? I guess I, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I would just add that um, it's, would, it's important to me that the school board goals be focused on school board issues and, or, or you know, the areas of a school board responsibility, um, which, which to me are setting, setting the direction for the district. Mm -hmm. um, establishing policy, uh, providing for accountability and community oversight and, and, um, and communication. Um, and I may be missing something, but I think those are the four, four elements that I've focused on as, as um, we better define the role of a school board in an, in an effective school district. Mm -hmm. um, so what would be important to me about the goals as we finalize them is that, that we, we stick to our, our job and we don't define as goals for ourselves work that needs, that you know, we hope gets, will be getting done in other parts of the district um, because it's not, our, it's not our role to be doing that work. Exactly. Thank you. Um, I was going to say something similar in that I, I think maybe not the, the need to call it the, the school board goal, but the need to evaluate and, and on a regular basis you know, as we're working on the, you know, developing rubrics for teacher evaluations, you know, if we evaluate ourselves and see how, where our weaknesses are, you know, in terms of how it aligns with the strategic plan, then it can help us, you know, pinpoint where we need to focus more energy and attention to. So call it goals or, or whatever you want to call it. I think an evaluation process annually is important, you know, of ourselves and our direction. Um, I, 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 I sort of look at this two ways. One is I, I agree with Joe that in a way for our, for us to stay focused on what are the 14, 15 or 15, 16 parts of the strategic plan for which we have some direct responsibility, it might be good to surface those. On the other hand, I listened to David's comment saying, why do we have to be redundant about what's already in the plan and have them in our goals? I'm sort of torn with that. And the other part of my head is, I know that um, superintendents appreciate us sticking to the goals that are established in the strategic plan and not layering on a lot of other stuff. So how to best do that in the sort of context of our retreat and noting the sort of stress of multiple initiatives 
and wanting to be on that is what I was attempting probably clumsily to capture. So, so those are the things sort of spinning in my head a little bit. I don't have a great and answer. I, and, I, and I think that the goals as drafted or the, go, or the goals that we had adopted last year, either, you know, as just by way of examples, they don't, they, they, they don't, they don't do that. They don't, they don't add, uh, the only area where, where, we, where we add um, elements that are not specifically part of the strategic plan are, are areas where we've asked for um, an update mm -hmm. from building administrators, perhaps, on a, on a specific initiative, but not... Mm -hmm. um, not a new direction. But not a new direction. We, we haven't, I don't think we've, we've, we've done that. I th and to the point where the, the goals don't seem fun anymore because we put a, you know, a goal is, you know, pass and support a budget that, you know, supports our strategic plan and it doesn't seem um, very ambitious, but in fact, you know, what, we're, what that means, I think, is that we're operating within our, within our boundaries. Perfect. You could probably limit it to two things, support our strategic plan and come up with a budget that, that funds and implements a strategic plan. I mean, this, as, as a board, I agree, I, I agree with your point, as a board, um, our, our goal is, we, we've done it with the strategic plan, our, goal, our, our role now is to help uh, the district, you know, from the administrators, teachers, everybody to, to get it done. So. I, um, yeah, I think it's great having a strategic plan, but at the same time, it doesn't encompass everything that the district needs to do. Um, in other words, uh, you know, in the strategic plan, it may not even say, you know, um, you know, foster an environment of, uh, you know, open communication. So, I'm not convinced that just because you have a strategic plan that that covers all the issues and challenges for a school district. It can't. There's a lot, a lot of areas that that it can't. So I'm, well, I'm happy we have a strategic plan. I think um, we need to be mindful of the enormous ask of of teachers and staff and administrators. And the you know that we're asking it's very ambitious. So um, you know I'm happy to say we do have a strategic plan, but the school board recognizes there's some areas that we need to um, the district needs to improve on um, to make the plan a reality and to you know be responsive to feedback you get from you know different stakeholders. So I think we can have a happy medium. I do think the school board. If you make it a goal, we'll hold ourselves accountable to it. And, um, you know, we may not prescribe the remedy, but, um, you know, I think if there's some items we think and know that we need to address, that it's worth having those as a, as a goal, even, as, you know, even without prescribing a, a remedy to it. So, um, you know, I think you can do, you can do both of them. Okay. Um, the only add to that is the communication piece between, I always want to figure out a way that if the uh, community knows what our plan is, what the, the school board plan is, what our roles are, what the um, administration roles and then the teachers and then um, all the other, all the administration of roles are, then there's less time for um, parents to worry. It's, um, it's right out there, and the whole community knows what's going on, not only parents in the school system, but parents who, uh, adults who don't have children in the school system. So the more we communicate, if we, um, so communication is the one piece, you know, follow the strategic plan, um, make, sure to, uh, make sure that we evaluate ourselves and that we're not giving the school more work, but then take the burden off of the school to communicate it out to the larger community. That's a piece that we really, ha we, we have it in the strategic, we have it in the budget with um, an HR person, well, I guess not really an HR person, but um, the website. The, the, website, the yeah. And so that's really, that's another piece that we haven't been that active with, that we're doing the work, and I think we could do better at it. And I do like Susanna's idea of being, uh, you know, 
um, you know, we're asking staff and administrators, you know, uh, you know, be open to a 360 evaluation. So a great way may be to, you know, do it to ourselves, you know, send out a survey, you know, what's your perception of the school board? What are their strengths? They what are their weaknesses? Years when they elect us. Well, absolutely, but I think, you know, if we're looking for guidance on what we should spend our time on and, you know, have, you know, it'd be anonymous, obviously, for staff and administrators, um, you know, but if we're looking for guidance, um, you know, or suggestions on, you know, uh, you know, our goals and, you know, our, you know, how effective we've been, I, you know, I think it's, it wouldn't be fun necessarily for everyone or all of us, but I think it would help us, you um, be grounded in reality in terms of, you know, different, different viewpoints. So pull it all together, Joe. I'm, I'm making mental gymnastic notes in my head about what to do next with the school board goals. So well, I, I guess I'm, I'm not sure what uh, Michael is advocating. Uh, there are certain goals that are a function of a school board. Mm -hmm surveying people in the town whether they think I'm doing a good job or not. There is a way that they can tell me I'm not. They cannot elect me. Uh, so I, I, I'm never, I'm not a big fan of surveys. They're opinions. And usually, uh, not usually, but often they're opinion. Uh, and they're not necessarily well founded in fact. And I'm not sure how much, of, I mean, quite frankly, I'd probably rather ask all the teachers and the, and the administrators what they think we're doing. They're probably more knowledgeable. So to me, the school board goal, if it still exists, should be if we, and we're at the beginning of the we're at the beginning of the year, so how do we know what other goals we might have? So I, I part of it is bothers me that um, you lock yourself in. But I, I, if if we have some things that we think we'd like to do this year, and it's a school board level issue, and it's something we would like to see have accomplished, then we ought to put that item, and then we don't necessarily figure out how to do it. And, uh, and that's what we do during the year. And if other ones come up, you can always add them. I, I don't know. I just, I, I, look, I look at last year's, I thought it was a good list. Um, a lot of them aren't done. In fact, about eight of them, nine aren't done, or nine are, it, you could almost take last year's, do it literally the same, add a couple of things that have come up uh, in the last four or five months or so, at, but as a goal, like school culture, climate and culture, put it down, you know. Evaluate, and I can't call it a good word, facilitate school culture. That might be one. But um, mm -hmm. how we do it, uh, there are a lot of ways to figure it out, and I'm not an expert, but um, my personal view is what we had last year is probably just as good a list of goals with, with a couple ones that are, in, in, but phrase them as goals. You know, a, a one, a five, maybe I'm not the one to do this, but maybe a short, pithy sentence, but. Um, I think we can do it. That would be my suggestion. Yeah, no, I, I, no, I think you could, you, you could do that from based on what you have to around this year. So in, in other words, it would just be boiling, boiling them down a bit toward the, what, the, what the goal is, being a little less prescriptive about how we're going to go about accomplishing the goal, but being clear about what, the, you know, what we're trying to achieve. And then with respect to Barbara's, point that we, you know, we, we don't want to be layering on new initiatives. We, we want our goals to be supporting district goals that are already in place. I'll throw one last thought out, Joe, whether that helps in the redraft or not is um, find out. Um, given the, the um, sort of intensity of the strategic plan and its length, I'm not sure how many people really dive into it to see what's going to happen in a given year. It might be good to have that um, Explicit. What are we really looking for? And, and I don't know when we're talking about it in January, in February of 15, if we're talking 15, 16, or 15 and part of 16, or what. But, but perhaps to be explicit about what the plan is calling for right now that we're going to be looking to hear about and say that here are the strategic plan goals to which we will be atten you know, paying attention and monitoring. Here are a couple of additional goals we ask happen, whether or not you all agree or not that some um, nod towards school culture or whatever, because as we talked in the retreat, it's really this, this in response to these multiple initiatives that I think we're trying to be a little sensitive. When you have a five-year plan, it's really long, 
you know, and so diving in and showing what's current and what are a couple of things that could really help in implementation may be a way to surface that simply and it doesn't layer on anything mm -hmm. um, that's inappropriate. So, I just trying to say that I think it's a very good point. It'd be hard for Joe or me or anybody to take a look at that speaking plan without speaking to every principal and every minister. So yeah. What do you think you can do this yeah. year? Yeah. Uh, that's tough, but I, I see a point. John? I, I just wanted to respond to that by, because we're still on the air by saying that there, there, I know the superintendent has done some work on producing and with Joe on, on putting together so, uh, some some communications around um, pr the presentation of the strategic plan just along those lines so that Good. people can see exactly you know what are the what are the coming goals for the next school year and the school year after that because it is a long you know it is a long plan so I know some of that work is is of doing a better job of, of presenting the plan is is being done thank you Joe So let me try to reiterate quickly and succinctly. So I'm hearing there's still support for having school board goals, and that those goals need to somehow fit in between the wedge of what's already outlined in the strategic plan, and also not reiterate what we are already by law dictated that is our responsibility as a school board, the fiduciary responsibility of passing a budget and monitoring and evaluating the process of things that are happening in the school. But somewhere in between, sort of addressing, maybe highlighting, addressing challenges, and supporting both of those efforts. I would just add that the, I think the format of last year where you stated in specific. line, a category, and then we figure out how to do it or have people figure out for us how to do it is a, is a, is a good approach. I really don't, I don't mind, I mean, you, I don't, you could make your own decision about this, I don't want to make it more difficult for you, but I don't mind stating explicitly as a school board goal uh, some of the work that we, we have to do by law, because I think it helps, just as, as you were saying, Barbara, I think it helps the community understand what it is that we do, and there's an enormous amount of work that goes into um, contract uh, negotiations, for example. Um, or, um, or the budget work, uh, and it, if we were to leave that those basics out of um, out of our goals, uh, I think it would be it, it wouldn't be as clear to the public what it is that we do all year. I'm probably the one who came up with a comment about I think I might have been who knows. Uh, it's good to have a school board goal, something we have to do anyways. But I, I listening to John find myself agreeing with them and it's in last year's goal but it's just a goal pass a budget that supports the strategic plan sponsor a budget that supports the strategic plan and maintains vital programs and services something that simple but I, I have no problem with listing it as a goal in fact I'll give it to you I like last year's goals with a couple changes from what I've heard people are concerned about and I'll give it to you and that would be my thoughts but I, I guess I, I, I John has convinced me that it's good to put down some of the things that we have to do because it shows we're doing something. Okay, I think I'm at a good place. I, I appreciate the rich conversation on this. So for next steps, why don't I revise the goals and send them back out via email? And perhaps maybe we could come to a place where we support them and vote on them, put them on the next business meeting for March. Does that sound? Can I just ask a question about, I thought our, we cannot discuss things over email. So that's um, just clear. Uh, that's not true. We, we can't discuss things over emails. We just don't vote. Well, that, that's still not even quite clear. The, the, you can't have a meeting, but emails can potentially be meetings when everybody has it. But the reality is a, um, you have, the law, I'm not going to speak for our lawyers, but the point is you still have to be able to talk before you have a meeting, otherwise you never get any work done. The point is you can't make decisions or argue for a particular decision to be made except in a public meeting. So circulating for informational purposes is fine. And responding to the goal. Right, and just, in just in, in suggesting your ideas. But then when you cross that line to advocating for a particular thing, when you know it's going to come to a vote. And that's a gray area. 
So I think what, what Joe's proposing is perfectly appropriate. Right. Well, that's why I've been out of the email loop because I thought we were not to discuss it past. So, um, well, as I said, we all communicate, we get stuff all the time by a group email, and it's informative. We have to do it that way. Okay. Unless you can read my mind, Kate. That's uh -huh. the only way we can do it. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you all for this rich conversation on our school board goals. <laughs> Hopefully, if somebody's still watching this, this is awesome. Um, I have nothing left on the agenda this evening. Any other questions before we adjourn? Uh, for the workshop agenda or, okay. Please. Okay. Are we looking at the... <gasps> that's, 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 that's a special, special business. Okay. Next. We're only Why 10 minutes off the timeline. Sitting around here. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're done with the workshop agenda. We're done with the workshop agenda. We, do you want to reiterate when the school board business workshops are? Uh, they, I think I've, uh, the next one is March 3rd. What topics will be discussed are on the budget website page on the school district website. Um, so that would be the best place to, to look and get updates or revisions. Um, so we'll leave it at that. Thank you. So that concludes our um, school board business workshop for this evening. Um, we now move into our special business agenda. May I have a motion to convene a special business meeting? Um, I don't think we need that. We don't need that if we're going to vote. We don't need to be in a special business meeting to vote. We, we need to be in a special business meeting, but we never begin our special business meetings with a motion to convene a special business meeting. Do we? We begin executive sessions that way, but not special business meetings. Okay. But we can we do can, it. We can vote. <laughs> <laughs> well, first we're going to do the finance. I think motion. Thanks. Mm -hmm. the finance report. Yeah. Here. In a regular yeah. meeting.